Happy Easter. And for those of you who are watching on our live stream, a happy Easter to all of you as well. Just to report, uh, there, are, there are lots of people here today, and it's such a joy to welcome folks back into this holy place. As John Dominic Crossin has written, without Easter, we would not know Jesus. If his story had ended with his crucifixion, he most likely would have been forgotten. Jesus would have been another Jew crucified by the Roman Empire in a bloodthirsty first century that witnessed thousands of such executions. Perhaps Josephus, the Jewish historian, might have mentioned him, but that probably would have been the extent of his popularity. So Easter is utterly central. But the question for us today is this, what is Easter? What are the Easter stories about? On one level, the answer is obvious. God has raised Jesus from the dead. Indeed, but what does that mean? And is it about the most spectacular miracle that has ever been? Is it about the promise of an everlasting life? Is it about God proving that Jesus was indeed his son? Croissant goes on to suggest, when we think about Easter, we must consider several foundational questions. What kind of stories are Easter stories? What kind of language are they told? And how is that language being used? And are they intended as historical reports and thus to be understood as history remembered? Or do they use the language of parable and metaphor to express truths that are much more than factual? Or is it some combination of the two? Well, there you have it. That's the way you're going to start your conversations around the dinner table this afternoon. All right? We'll see how far you get. I instructed Angus on Friday night to read the gospel story and it was as it was originally found, and he did an excellent job. He left out a couple of words at the end of the text, which is exactly what I instructed him to do. And the sudden ending to the first gospel has spawned much consternation. For many scholars have suggested that the true ending of the gospel of Mark has been lost. It is well documented that verses 9 through 20 are a much later addition as the Christian community tried to loose up, tie up loose ends. I've always wanted on Easter Day to do that thing in Dead Poet Society. Remember when Robin Williams says, rip it out, rip out that page. But I know I'd get into so much trouble with all of you for ripping out a page in the Bible, all right, that it just wouldn't work. However, that, those 11 verses don't work. It's to soften up the ending, make everybody happy, go home happy. That's not the point. So if you go home today and rip that page out of the Bible, I will not say thee nay. But what is interesting to consider is the fact that tragedies in antiquity could conclude on a note of departure. As Gilbert Bezalikian, I've been working on that one for all, all week, in his book, he's wrote a wonderful book, The Liberated Gospel, a comparison of the Gospel of Mark and Greek tragedy. Even on a hasty exit, he writes, of the kind described in the last verse of the gospel, a stage suddenly left vacant by sometimes precipitate dismiss dismissal of the characters seems to have been an acceptable convention for ending tragedies. He writes, if Mark was inspired by tragedy in structuring the gospel, the dramatic effectiveness of graphic action in the form of rapid departure to bring a composition to an expressive end could hardly have escaped his notice. Brian, are you suggesting that this story is a tragedy? No, but on the face value, it appears to be so, unless we understand all the symbolism of these incredible eight verses. So, either open up your Bibles or look at your text, because we're going to have some fun. Chapter 16, with its eight verses, is magnificently crafted, full of imagery, and leaves not answers, but lots of questions. And the story is rescued from its tragic ending. It is not a happy ending in which all is resolved. Rather, the issues of our discipleship is given the promise to continue. I want to start just before with Joseph of Arimathea. That's chapter 15, verse 46. 
It says this, and Joseph brought a linen shroud and taking Jesus down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid Jesus in a tomb which had been hewn out of a rock. And Joseph rolled the stone against the door of the tomb and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jose saw where Jesus was laid. So before the Sabbath, Joseph of Marimathea, a member of the Jewish council, did four things. He brought a linen. He wrapped Jesus' body and gave Jesus an improper burial. He put Jesus in the tomb and he rolled the stone across the opening. The women, in contrast, offer a mission of mercy on the morning of the new week. Look what they do. Now you can look at your text. They buy spices. They go to the tomb. And they go to the tomb early on that first morning to anoint Jesus' Jesus's body for a proper burial. And they discuss who is going to roll away the stone from the entrance. Because that stone is big. And a reader with an eye for detail would also wonder about the stone. But the women discover that the stone has been rolled back. Do we know how yet? No. We have no idea. And don't start thinking about angels, because we're not there yet. Look at the text. Perhaps there is still hope that this tragedy would be overturned. So look at the, first, the fifth verse. The fifth verse. It starts with this. And entering the tomb, the women saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were deeply troubled. Now, two things stand out to me there. Which two? Right side, white robe. Let's look at it. This verse alone could fill our afternoon and imagination, for it is flowing with symbolism that Mark has used elsewhere in his gospel. Notice carefully that this is a young man. We don't know if he's an angel or not, at least not yet. And he's sitting on the right side. And this is the position for which the former inner circle of the male disciples had competed for in chapter 10 and which the psalmist attributed to the Messiah in chapter 12. And Jesus said that the, Son of Man, that the Son of Man would sit on the right hand of God in chapter 14. And this was attributed to the bandits in chapter 15. So this is important symbolism. And it's the symbolism of the true power of solidarity with God and humanity. And I believe that that's the point that Mark is trying to make, is that God is with us. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, there is God. And there is solidarity between God and God's creation. Second, this young man is wrapped in a white robe. It is the same color and same word used to describe Jesus' garments in his transfiguration. And it also is the identical phrase used to describe the apparel of martyrs in the book of Revelation. It's a terrible translation that we use today, and I should have changed it. Um, that when it finally says, the women, it says, I believe in your text, are amazed. That could mean so many things. It's much better, deeply troubled, a verb that appears only three times in the Gospel of Mark. In the ninth chapter, it describes the reaction to the crowd about beholding Jesus after his transfiguration and the public teaching of the way of the cross. And in 14, chapter 14, it describes Jesus' struggle in Gethsemane to come to terms with his own execution. So each of these apocalyptic symbols compels the reader to conclude that the women now realize that they are in the presence of a heavenly messenger. You ever been in the presence of an angel? And don't tell me about your wife, <laughs> right? I'm talking about a heavenly angel. That can be fearful to fall in the hands of the living God. Verse 7. Ah. Do you know what I love about reading? You know this, and I say this all the time. It's when you read these texts over and over again, you miss things. And I've missed this in the Gospel of Mark for so many years, and I'm so grateful that I found it this year because it has rocked my world. Verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, yes, that he's going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. 
You see, from this moment on, the narrative functions as a reopening of the closed story of discipleship. Just days before this community had imploded in two stages, the first was the flight of the disciples when Jesus was arrested, and the second was Peter's denial. So now Mark is straightening out the problem with two directions. Tell the disciples, and don't forget our boy Peter, because he's really in trouble. What had he done? I mean, what happened to the 11? They just ran off. But Peter denied Jesus. We left him in the dark. And isn't he supposed to be, you know I want to get down here. Don't you know that he's the rock? He's the one that the whole church is going to be built on? And he's the one who denied Jesus. How can we have somebody who denied Jesus be the rock? It doesn't make any sense. So we've got to clean this up. So tell the disciples, ladies, tell Peter to get busy and go to Galilee. And there you will see him. So the question I have for each one of us as we begin to close is where is your Galilee? Where is your Galilee? The Galilee for the disciples and Peter was where they were first called, first named disciples and apostles, where they were first sent on a mission, where they were first taught by Jesus. In other words, the women and all of us are being reminded that the story which appeared to have ended in Jerusalem is beginning all over again. The story is not linear with a distinct starting point and termination, but is in fact circular, and it is beginning all over again. And so I want to make sure that we take a moment to really think about this carefully, about resurrection as it is understood in the Gospel of Mark. The full revelation of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Christ, has resulted, as Chad Myers has written in his commentary, in neither a triumphal victory for the community as the disciples had hoped, nor the restored kingdom of David as the rebels had hoped, nor a tragic failure and defeat as the reader might have feared. This story has ended in nothing more and nothing less than the regeneration of the mission of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is still going before us. And this invitation by Jesus via the young man to follow him to Galilee is the last call of discipleship in the Gospel of Mark. My brothers and sisters, where's your Galilee? Where's your Galilee? Because there you will see Jesus, who is calling each one of us to the way of the cross. Is it your home, your business, school, social network? family, extended family, church family? Is it the poor, the brokenhearted, the hungry, the naked, the prisoner and captive? So in reality, it is everyone and everybody. And what are we supposed to accomplish once we return to our Galilee? And this is the cool part. It's really simple. Love, thanks for coming. Love, that's it. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another, and everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Dr. Carl Menninger said, love cures people, both the ones who give it and the ones who receive it. There's a story told of Mahatma Gandhi, and as he stepped aboard a train one day, one of his shoes slipped off and landed on the track. And he was unable to retrieve it as the train was moving. And to the amazement of his companions, Gandhi calmly took off his other shoe and threw it back along the track to land as close to the first. Asked by a fellow passenger why he did so, Gandhi smiled and said, the poor man who finds the shoe lying on the track, he replied, will now have a pair he can use. Love. Two brothers worked together on a family farm. One was married and had a large family. The other was single. And at the end, the day's end, the brothers shared everything equally, produce and profit. 
And one day the single brother said to himself, it is not right that we should share equally the produce and profit. I'm alone and my needs are simple. So each night he took a sack of grain from his bin and crept across the field between their houses, dumping it into his brother's bin. And meanwhile, the married brother said to himself, it is not right that we should share the produce and profit equally. After all, I'm married and I have my wife and children to look after me in the years to come. My brother has no one and no one to take care of his future. So each night he took a sack of grain and dumped it into his single brother's bin. Well, both men were puzzled for years because their supply of grain never dwindled. And then one dark night, the two brothers bumped into each other. And slowly it dawned on them what was happening. And they dropped their sacks and they embraced one another. Love. My brothers and sisters, we are standing on the precipice of something new. In this moment, the community of Jesus Christ's ability to imagine a loving future is more crucial than ever before. We will never secure the just world we all deserve if we do not have the moral courage to dream what it will look like. We must love so there is abundance rather than scarcity. We must love our neighbors and work for the dismantling of structural racism and white supremacy. We must love the creation and practice good stewardship for the environment so that our children and their children and their children will have a beautiful and safe world in which to live. We must love so that the LGBTQ community is guaranteed their rights and we must treat every sexual identity and gender identity as sacred. We must love and practice reconciliation like Jesus did with your neighbor, your spouse, your partner, your children, your peers at work, so that they may know the abundant love of God. We must love so that we can transform government of the people and by the people and for the people from myth into reality. We must love and bring good news to the poor, to love and proclaim release to the captives, to love and let the oppressed go free, to love and proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. My brothers and sisters, we are the hands and we are the feet and we are the heartbeat of God. And if you wish to experience the resurrection of Jesus, go to your Galilee and love unconditionally. In the end, Julian of Norwich, the 13th century mystic, said it so well. Do you wish to understand your Lord's meaning? Understand truly, love was his meaning. Who revealed it to you? Love. What did he show you? Love. Why did he show it? For love. Hold firmly to this, and you will learn and know more of this, but you will never know or learn anything other than this, ever. So our work goes on, our labor for love continues. I look forward to seeing you in Galilee. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>